This video builds on the last video where I showed you how to create objects and in particular create objects with attributes which are dynamically defined using the init function. You're looking at the spider IDE of course and in the left window here is the code and the editor that we used last time. So last time we had defined this code in order to create a class called product and below that are two lines where we created two instances of the products. One was a milk product which we called milk 23 and the other was a cereal product which we called CER or CER 12. So that's what we had done last time. Now before I get to the actual Python coding here I want to show you a couple of things that might be in the tricks category. Sometimes when you open up a file and try to uh, execute code into the console, it won't work. Nothing will happen. And that often occurs because the console has gotten disconnected from the editor. So every time you create an editor, it has to know that there's a console to write the code to and there has to be a connection. If that happens to you, you need to go to the consoles menu here and open a new IPython console. So I'm going to demonstrate this. First, I'm going to kill the console that we currently have by clicking on the X. And now I'm going to go to the console menu and open a IPython console. So now I ought to be able to run this code by selecting it and then hitting F9. And let me make the console window a bit bigger. And you'll see that, in fact, the product class definition was run. And after that, the creation of the two instances for the milk and the cereal products occurred. So the next thing I want to show you, which is also sort of a trick, is how to set up things in the editor so that you can conveniently run specific blocks of code. And this idea is the creation of cells within the editor, and it's done in the following way. Before the block of code that I want to run, I'm going to put in pound, the comment character, and then percent percent. And after the block of code, I'm going to put in another pound, and then percent percent again. And I'm going to actually divide our code into two cells one for the definition of the class product and the other for the execution of the code that creates the two instances. So I've gone down here just behind that code that creates the instances and put in another pound percent percent. Now I can execute the cell that my cursor is in no matter where it is by clicking on this icon right here which has a, a help menu that comes up and says run current cell. So if I go ahead and do that, what you're going to see here is that only the definition of the product class was executed. So basically I can work on this block of code and run it over and over again, uh, for example, making sure that there are no syntax errors. And then when I want to run the code that creates the instances, I can just stick my cursor anywhere down there and then a click on this icon again and it will run this block of code or this cell. So creating cells is a very useful thing to do in the editor because it allows you just to, to work on little pieces of code and to execute them conveniently. Even more conveniently than using the icon up here, I can just use control enter. So control enter will execute the current block. So I just type control enter and you see that it created the product class again. So that's control enter. If I want to execute a block of code and move on to the next cell, I can do shift enter. So you'll see that my cursor will now drop down to the next cell here and then I can just easily execute that by doing shift enter again. So control enter executes the current cell but doesn't move. Shift enter executes the current cell 
and then moves to the next cell. So that's just a couple of convenience things. So now I want to get into talking about Python again. And I wanted to make it clear, which I think it probably is because of the way I showed you about objects before, but when you create a class-like product, most of the time for most of the variables you're going to want to create them dynamically using the init function as I showed you last time. But you can also have variables that are defined for every instance. So I've shown you that here by putting in this line that says version is equal to and then this string ver 1.2 rev 3. It's actually rather hard to think of reasons why you would want these variables which are going to be identical for every instance of the class that you create. But certainly a version number is one thing that you might want. The version number will allow you to keep track of whether or not different objects were created um, using different, different revisions of the code. So for example, if you come in here and make changes to this code, you're going to want to change the revision number. Now if I execute this definition of product, which I've already done a few times, but let me go ahead and do it again, and then create a couple of instances. So I'm executing these cells now with control enter. You'll see that each of these instances contains the version number, so serial 12.version. All right. So I just wanted in this video to reinforce the idea that you can in fact have these variables which are not dynamically created as well as the ones that are. Now I also want to be clear about a little bit of terminology. These variables that are associated with an object are called attributes. So for example version is an attribute which will be attached to every instance of this object product. All of these variables that are created dynamically are also attributes. For example, skew is an attribute, as is name, and so on. These are dynamically created, and they can change depending on the particular type of instance that's created. So that's the idea of attributes. Now, we also obviously have seen a function associated with this class product namely this very special function init surrounded by two underscores on either side. This init is executed automatically when product is used to create an instance. And so it's a very special function. It's not called by the programmer directly. It's a private function. You can also have other functions which are not private. And I'm going to create one right now that is sort of a convenience function for this object. These functions that are associated with an object are referred to as methods. And the idea of tightly binding a function is a very important idea because there are many kinds of things that you might want to do to various objects with functions that depend on the object itself. As an example of this, I'm going to add a method to this product class that will print out the information in a halfway decent format. Now to save time in the video I've already created this code so what I'm going to do is copy it and paste it in here and then make sure it works. I actually put the code further down in the file so the method that we are going to create is called print with a capital P so let me just go ahead and select that. And now I'm going to copy it up to where we were creating the product class. First I'm going to do control X to cut it out. And then I'm going to come over here and do control V to paste it in. Now this code is still commented out so I'm going to show you another trick that's kind of useful. If I select this block of code I can add or remove comments by doing control, holding the control key, and then one. Okay, so control one will put them back in, control one will take them out. Uh, how did I learn about this? Well, in many of the menu items, 
there are shortcuts indicated. So for example, under the edit menu, there's an item that says comment, uncomment, and on the right hand side there's the, the shortcut. So being able to comment out a block of code is very useful. Now that I have pasted this code in, I want to check things a little bit to make sure that it's going to run. In particular, this function needs to be indented one time, and then the code that defines the function needs to be indented another time. Now, I copy and pasted this in in order to save time, but I do want to explain quickly what's going on here. What I want to do is define a function which will print the information in this object in uh, an attractive or reasonably attractive way. And I'm doing this by creating a string called out, which I will then print. So I just create the string that I want and then print it. It's very simple. Methods or functions defined inside a class automatically get as their first argument self which is a reference to the object that's being created. So what I want to do here is print out the name, the SKU, and so on. I'm doing this by creating just one long string, and I'm using some special symbols in the string to cause it to format in the way I want. In particular, backslash n says give me a new line. So what's happening here is I drop down a line I'm going to then print out name colon. Now backslash T says tab, and I'm going to tab twice. Then I'm going to print out self.name, but the plus sign right here concatenates the two strings. So what I've actually done is I've gone all the way through all the stuff that I want to print out, and I've just concatenated using plus signs the strings that are serving as labels and also contain information about where I want things to be moved and the actual variables that are referred to by self dot whatever the, the variable name is. So we should get a new line then we should get name and the colon two tabs and the name of the product then we should drop down a line have SKU colon two tabs and then we have the SKU then we drop down a line, we get the brand, we get the manufacturer. Then we come to the dimensions, which was a list. And so at the end of the manufacturer here, I actually put in two new lines so that there's going to be a space, so it will format nicely. And then I print the label dimensions and a new line. Now, I didn't say and should have that these backslash characters here are the symbol for continuing a line in Python. So instead of just having one huge line that stretches out to the right here for miles and miles, I can break my lines and put a backslash character and that way I can, can make the code in the editor be much more readable. So I'm going to have a label dimensions and then I'm going to tab in once, so this will be indented, and I'll print the width and here's something I should point out. The width is a number. It's not a string. So in order to concatenate it to a string, I have to use str, which converts it to a string. If I don't do that, I'll get an error message. So I print out the width and immediately follow it with the very last element in the dimensions list, which is inches in this case as a string. So I don't have to convert it. So I print out the width and inches, the depth and inches, the height and in inches. I then put in a blank line because I have two new lines here and I put out the weight and its units. So let me go ahead and define this class product and my cursor is now in this cell so I can just do control enter and it will be defined. And let me quickly scroll up here to make sure there's no obvious syntax errors. And so now I can execute the next block of code, again with control enter, which defines the two instances milk 23 and serial 12. And so now if I take either of these instances and type the instance name dot print with a capital P, because I defined this with a capital P, open paren and close paren, what I should get is the information in this object serial 12 printed in a reasonable format. 
So there it is. I have printed out serial 12. Here's the name. It's VG Cornflakes. Here's the SKU. It's CERO12. The brand is very good brand. It's made by a, a contract manufacturer, House Products Inc. The dimensions are width, depth, and height of 9, 3, and 11 inches and a weight of 18 ounces. So I've showed you now how to create a method that is a part of the class definition of object. So before closing this video, I wanted to show you the built-in function dir, which provides information about any object that you give it as an argument. So if I do sear 12, what I'm going to do is get a list of all of the attributes of sear 12. So you can see that they are brand dimensions, manufacturer, and so on. It also lists out the private information. We defined, for example, the init function. Uh, we didn't define this doc or this module. They were created automatically. But again, things with two dashes here are private, and you shouldn't try to access those things directly. So after this video, you should be very clear about methods and attributes. And I've also shown you several tricks, such as creating cells in the editor and executing them, and commenting and uncommenting blocks of code, and also how to restart the IPython console if somehow your editor gets disconnected from the console.